eh, vi kommer göra så att vi har ju faktiskt en vinmakare med oss på länk. Vi är i Sydafrika här. Eh, de har ju inte riktigt samma kanske wifi-koppling på alla ställen. Så att vår vinmakare han har tagit sig till grannen för att kunna sända ordentligt. Eh, så att eh, vi tar oss igenom det och det ska bli jättekul. Jag har också jobbat på grafiken idag. Kört lite overlays. Pappa har spelat in en slinga på gitarren till det här. Så att eh, det blir bättre och bättre för varje gång. Vi kommer då köra oss igenom så att vi kommer prata lite. Jag ska alldeles strax bjuda in Johan, vår vinmakare. Och det, för mig så är det väldigt speciellt. Det är så att jag var, för de som inte vet, så var jag i Sydafrika och hade praktik hos Johan Meyer i februari. Så jag var där i tre veckor. Så det ska bli jättekul att prata med honom. Och det är första gången vi pratar så här över webben sen jag var där. Uh, annars så kommer jag lägga in lite frågestunder och vi kommer guida oss igenom och är det så att man har frågor så är det som vanligt bara att skriva i kommentarsfältet. Uh, tala jättegärna om hur många ni är som tittar, det är alltid intressant att veta eftersom jag ser enheter live, jag ser inte hur många man faktiskt är som tittar. Uh, till, till den här provningen så gjorde jag så att jag pratade ihop mig med importören Wine Rebels ifall de kunde sätta ihop en liten låda med vinerna vi ska prova idag. Och eh, det har jag gjort, tre viner. Så kolla jättegärna om ifall det är så att ni faktiskt har köpt vinen också och provar dem med oss. Eh, nog om mig, eh, jo lite annan info som kan vara kul att veta. Exakt ett år sedan idag så släppte vi Vinos app. Så jag tycker att vi säger lite... Hurra för eh, Vinos-appen! Um, nog om det. Jag tänker att vi bjuder in eh, Johan. Så att det är alltså Johan Meyer från Sverige. Hello! <laughs> can you see me? I can no, see you! you. <laughs> so everyone can see me now. Everyone can see you now! <laughs> okay, that's good. Hi everyone in Sweden. Uh, hello from a quite a cool, cold... Um, Swartland evening, um, but it's great to chat to you all, and I hope uh, you can get a good message through, and you can buy and drink more wines from South Africa. Yes, Cheers. this is amazing, um, and this is really fun because when I was in South Africa in February, it was like 45 degrees. It was so hot, and now it's dark and cold at your place. How how's the weather now? So it changed quite quickly. Uh, we've been at a, we actually had a quite a light kind of um, autumn and then autumn wasn't actually there it was hot hot and then all of a sudden it turned to five degrees celsius type of thing. so um, we had some good good rain that we really desperately need and um, it's it's yeah it goes dark quickly and we're on the mountain so it's slightly cooler than the rest of the Swartland um, I mean we are in the Grand Cru of the Swartland so um, yeah it's um, it's chilly and it's dark at about six so quite a different scene to what you've experienced last time. <laughs> yeah. A big, uh, big difference in the weather. Uh, but there's maybe a few people watching this tasting or this live uh, stream uh, that doesn't know who you are. Uh, so I'm thinking that we do a little bit of introduction about you. Um, who are you? <laughs> what, and what's, and what's your history? Do you really want to know or do you want to, do you want to know the, the pretty story or the real story? <laughs> I want to know the real story. No, I, I know, so don't tell me or there's a lot of things I don't know. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Johan Erman Meyer. Um, I'm from a little town on the southeast coast of South Africa, George. So it's a southern eastern part we where we farm with dairy cows and we use the vegetables and wine is just something that you see on tv and in the books you don't really experience anything from wine so um they don't really grow up with wine and and but came to Stellenbosch which is like the epicenter of wine in South Africa and they got introduced to that um kind of to short story is um, fell in love with it after six months of university probably fell in love with the wrong kind of wine but it was still wine in somehow um, and then decided to change courses and, and, and move away from the dairy industry because um, obviously it's better to drink a glass of wine than a glass of milk. Um, although I changed and, and started to go into viticulture and, and, and wine science, studied that for a little bit and um, 
maybe took a little bit longer than I thought I should take, but you know, you can can blame me if you're in Stellenbosch. And then traveled a bit, um, so California, New Zealand, um, France, Spain, um, and then came back to South Africa around 2008. Um, worked for a couple of people, tried to gather some cash, and then started JH Mayer Wines in 2010. So this was our 11th vintage this year. Um, so yeah, it's been going for a while. I mean, I've, I've worked many places and I've worked through different sellers in my life, um, from very big cooperative sellers to smaller kind of reserve, nice stuff. But um, I think it's a good overall of, of what the industry can give you. So yeah, um, dairy farmer turned winemaker. That's basically who I am. Surf once in a while. <laughs> you surf as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not allowed to surf though, because apparently COVID um, does spread in water as well. So oh, really? our government um, said we're not allowed to surf. But you can run in troops of 20 people, but you can't surf. Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, strange. Uh, my dad was talking about uh, sailing to uh, uh, the Canary Island at the moment. He said that it doesn't spread on the water, but you know. Never know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. But that's that's actually um, kind of interesting because you remember the first day when I actually, when I arrived at the airport, that was the first day that they actually checked the temperature on people um, mm -hmm. when I arrived now in February. Um, so we were very lucky with the, that we could finish the harvest, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think your timing was perfect. You know, um, I think everyone. I mean, it was a strange setup in South Africa when it when when they started with the lockdown and all of that. But I mean, your timing was good, and I think we we had a very good harvest. I, I think it was a it was a fun and a good year. Um, it was good to have all of you here. It's, we can't do harvest without our international representation. So thanks again for that. <laughs> no, it was. Yeah. That was that was amazing and one of my best experiences and you know I would like to come back but uh, we're not here to talk about my harvest uh, even though I could talk about it for um, <laughs> probably hours uh, but I'm thinking um, maybe if you want to tell uh, people a little bit about Svartland as uh, as a region um, or like South Africa like. How big is Svartland and for example and you know how many because there's there's a lot of talk about Svartland uh, I think but there's not that many like producers in Svartland really there's a lot of upcoming and but like if you compare yeah. to yeah look I think I mean I I when when I started to make wine I was actually down in Tilbach which is just the next valley and um, in that time, I was working in, 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 in California, and I always had a thing for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, so when I started the J.H. Mayer brand, which is focused on Pinot and Chardonnay, what we're going to taste tonight, um, I wasn't actually in the Swartland. You know, I was friends with some of the guys from the Swartland, but I, I've never, you know, I didn't make my wine there. It was in a different region and stuff. And um, through this whole movement, I, I think with the old Swartland revolution, with, you know, all the, the, the Aris and the Eben and, and all those guys that did a very good job for our region, at least, um, I saw this camaraderie and this, 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 this togetherness of people and winemakers and friends in this area that, that um, for me it was a, a no no brainer to move to the Swartland. You know, I was never intended. In my in my mind, I was always thinking I'm going to make wine in Elgin or in the Yemel and Arda or that region because that's where Pinot Noir and Chardonnay thrives. But I think the spirit of the people and the the the, the winemakers and in general just the, the the living conditions, if you want to call it that, in the Swartland is just something that. That no one can resist, you know. So, you know, it's 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 a it's a big place. It's a huge area. I think, you know, driving from the one end of the Swartland to the other end of the Swartland will probably take you two hours to drive. Um, to put that in perspective, in Stellenbosch, it takes you 20 minutes from the one side to the other side. The Appalachian. So it's a very big Appalachian, but it's an Appalachian that 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 basically is covered by wheat fields. Not the smoking wheat, there's some, but more the, that you, you make flour and stuff of. Um, there is, um, there's a lot of cattle, there's a lot of sheep farming, 
Um, and here and there, you'll see patches of little vineyards, you know. And, and in the old days, the Swartland was the, the bread basket of the, the industry. You know, a lot of bulk wines and a lot of, you know, Sinsos and Shenons that came in bulk for brandy distilling and for making basically crappy bulk wines came from the Swartland because we had good so soil. Um, at that stage, it was still raining quite a bit in Swartland, I guess. So we had good, we have good crop overall, you know. But, um, you know, that kind of faded away as soon as the prices dropped completely and there's a lot of the co-product sellers that didn't really go forward in in making wines and stuff and they they not even open these days anymore but anyway so it's a big region and farmers used to plant vineyards here because there was nothing else they can do with the land so if they can't farm with the sheep or they can't farm with the the weeds or they can't farm with anything else they plant a vineyard you know because it was easy and and back in the day people planted where it was easy to get to and there was water and this and that so it's in the old days, this white land was just, if I've got an open piece of land, I put a vineyard, I can make some little bit of bucks on the side and that's it. So there was never a focus or never a real, I want to say, uh, in in my opinion, a real um, lifestyle of wine in the white land. Wine was there. It was part of what we did and was part of the, the whole industry, but it was not a lifestyle like in, in Stellenbosch where everything was run around wine and wine was everything, the estates and the this and that. So... Um, but always good soils and always good terroir. And it's it's only lately, I mean, I think Eben is, is probably the guy that started everything um, in the up for Swartland in a good way, um, the Mullen use, the um, uh, Bardnos and those guys. And they started to see the potential in the Swartland and they started to see, but here is actually something that we can make amazing wine from. You just need a little bit of character and you need a little bit of personality behind it. And um, that kind of started, I guess, when I started with my brand around 2010, I think things really picked up for the Swartland in such a way. So people going out, finding these old, like neglected vignettes and starting to work with them and, and creating, you know, amazing, amazing wines. But to put it in perspective, it's a fucking warm area. You know, we, we get, you've seen it, we get up to 40, 45 degrees Celsius. Yeah. Um, it's dry. We don't get any rain. I think in the last couple of seasons we had a drought as well. But you know, your your, your average rainfall for the Swartland is about you know 350, 400 moles if you're lucky during the year, compared to Stellenbosch or Elgin, which is 1,200. Um, so it's dry. It's warm. It's harsh conditions. Um, you know, the, the farmers and the people aren't really equipped to farm vineyards, so it's, they've got big tractors and they've got big equipment and, you know, everything is, is, is there's more of a challenge to farm grapes. We don't really struggle with, like, um, fungicides and those kind of things, but the other thing we struggle, the thing we've had, what we've got is the sun, and I think the most important about that is looking after your vines and see how to manage the sun in such a way. So, big, gnarly um, warm, dry, um, that's kind of what the Swartland is. But it's got amazing microclimate within this big region. I think that is that is something that we're exploring with, and that's why I am where I am today on the mountain, because um, I think within this huge region, Appalachian called Swartland, there's at least five different soil types, five different terroirs, five different microclimates that puts it in perspective and saying, you know, does Swartland need to be covered over, over one area or do we need to subdivide this area? You know, I think Swartland as the brand is a good thing, but I think you need to focus on smaller appellations and wards and subdivisions from this big appellation called Swartland. But amazing place, fucking great people, great wines. Um, it just the atmosphere and, and, and the like I said, the camaraderie between winemakers in this area is just something that you can't replace anywhere in the world. Um, and um, yeah, we're close to the ocean, um, and we live a very African style life. You know, we always say African time. If you've seen it, you know, if yeah. that's you, you, you can be glad that I was on time tonight. I was literally two minutes before I had to go live, I was downloading Skype. I was, <laughs> so. gonna say, I was so nervous about this. I was like sitting here, it's like he's not going to be in time, never, never. <laughs> So I was like, okay, <laughs> we'll see if he comes. So yeah, I'm happy time that you're here. Is, um, a special time. <laughs> yeah. No, but this is uh, actually I have that as a topic later on in the tasting that we were going to talk about because you work very hard at the moment to make because you're on the mountain called Picket Bird uh, or in place um, and you are working very very hard to make that as 
like so you can put that on the bottles um yeah maybe we can take that now since we're talking so much about Svartland that's like all the different climates because you're uh, you you live um we can take it quick because with your wines now, uh, for me that I've seen that you you know you drive around for hours to pick your grapes during harvest, but now you've actually planted your vineyards and me and Nicole did the first harvest and you know it's tasting fucking good. Huh? I mean we I we opened a bottle the other day and it's it's really uh, you yeah. did a good job. <laughs> it will be a very expensive bottle, but you know you planted Sauvignon Blanc on a place where some like no one else probably would because you did all this research and uh, i remember like so when you we talked in the car and you told me about all these like uh, people that uh, uh, what they planted before back in the days and now all this with old vines old vineyards and maybe vineyards that are planted not like grapes not in the perfect soil and stuff like that and I think that's um, like for you, like putting Pickerberg is different from another place in in Swartland. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, the put it in. There's three, I guess, four mountains in in the Swartland that's quite serious. You know, you got the um, you get the Paderberg Mountain, which is where all the guys are. So that's the granite soils. You know, Ivan Sari Adi, Jurgen from Interlego. Uh, there's a couple of guys that's based in that area. That's kind of the, the main mountain that everybody knows, everybody talk about, and the Paderberg is kind of where everybody runs to. Um, but then you move up north from there and you get the Ribeca Steel, which is the Ribeca Mountain, which is more focused on schist soils. So it's completely different. And they, they're about a 20-minute drive from each other, but it's completely different terroir, completely different soil. Um, the microclimate is di different, um, different aspect, everything. Then you go a little bit more north from there and you get the Muriesberg or Koringberg, um, which is more clay. You know those red soils you see when you were driving, like really red clay soils. Um, so focused on heavy clay-based soils. Um, and then you go even north from there and then you reach us, which is the Bukitberg. And, and we completely different again going into sandstone soil. So you got the four main soil types, which is the granite, the schist, the clay and the sandstone and the more north you go the more it kind of you know changes in in a way um and for me what i've always said and to come back to my first story is i, I focus on pinot noir and chardonnay and for me that's a love affair that i picked up about 12 years ago and i wouldn't leave it you know so for me being in the swartland i still want to make those varieties and to have those varieties you need cool climate you need altitude you need enough rainfall you need certain facing slopes. There's a lot of aspects you have to look at before you can plant things like that. And um, I've been looking far and wide and somehow I found this place in the Swartland. I never thought I would make these kind of varieties in the Swartland, but we always, we surf a lot in Ilans Bay, which is just down the road from here, basically. And we always used to drive, me and Jürgen used to drive past the mountain and always thinking, you know, there's, there's something going on up there and we have to go look. And as you drive up in the mountain and you can, um, confess to that you drive up and you drive into this kind of green foresty you know you're driving into Elgin right in the heart of the Swartland and to see that and to 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 see the landscape and to see the growth and stuff you already realize like there's something special here um, so I just to come to the area we bought at the place in 2016 and then we put up a weather station and, and tracking the weather for the last four years before we planted, which was last year. And um, just to give you an example, and for the people listening that, that might know a little bit of South Africa and where Pinot Noir and Chardonnay actually grows, is the Yemlin Arda. That's kind of the thing that everybody go to. You know, if you talk Pinot Sart, you go Yemlin Arda in South Africa. <clears throat> and to give you an example of temperatures, I just got the latest statistics. Uh, fuck that English word went out of my mouth. But statistica, <laughs> if I can say it enough, it's it statistic in Swedish, so it's almost the same. <laughs> yeah, so um, what I got from the weather station, and uh, I give you an example. So you saw how hot it was this year. Yeah. So our average day temperature in December was 18.5 degrees Celsius. Our nighttime average temperature in December was 7 degrees Celsius. Whoa. January. January was really hot. January is not the hottest, but February is the hottest, but January is quite hot. 
January, average day temperature for January, 19.8, so still below 20. Average nighttime temperature, 7.9 for the Bukit Bear. February, which is the hottest month in South Africa in all the regions, in Swartland, it gets really hot. I mean, you were here and you saw the temperatures and you saw what happens. Average day temperature for the hottest month in the summertime up here, 21.4 degrees Celsius. Nighttime temperature, 8.9 degrees Celsius. So if you look at that, if you just look at that and you look at, because I get all the regions, I get like a uh, overall, because I deal with fruit farmers and they give me all this info. If you look at that statistic, we about two degrees cooler than Hermanus and about three to four degrees cooler average than Elgin. So now you, you take that and you say, yeah, Swartland is Swartland, but now you're going 800 meters altitude. You're going on a climate that's completely different from the rest of the Swartland. And just looking at that is something that you, you know, what, what does a grape want? The thing is with Elgin and with, with the Yemen Arda, they've got humidity and they've got these temperatures it's cooler temperatures, but it comes with rain and comes with humidity. And grapes doesn't like rain and humidity in growing season. Um, what we have is dry, warm-ish days and ice-cold nights. I mean, we were laughing so at you guys that come from Sweden and Austria and Canada. And you come here and you wear jackets at night. It's like, what the fuck? You're coming from minus 25 degrees and you come wear a jacket in, in the Swartland in summertime, you know? But it's something like that, that you can see, you know, that day-night fluctuation, which is amazing for grapes and it's amazing for Pinot Noir, for Chardonnay, for Sauvignon. So it's, it's just taking the weather on its own. It's a cool climate region. Um, taking the, the soils, um, we're quite different from the rest. Um, we sit with more of the sandstone soils. Um, coffee club, which is like the ferrocrete soil, is quite big up here. Uh, we've got patches of clay. Um, it's very, very, very diverse. On, on my six hectares that we planted last year, there's about eight different soil profiles, for example. But anyway, so you take all these things and you put it on a piece of paper and, and even not looking where you are in the world, and you just put these facts onto paper. The first thing that's going to link is going to be Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, cool climate grapes. And then you look at where you are in the world and you're like, what the fuck, I'm in the Swartland and I'm planting these things. And, and there's a lot of people probably in the industry thinking, what is this guy doing? You know, he's never going to succeed. And in, in, But they don't know the area. And you, if you haven't lived here and you haven't experienced summer and winter here, you'll never know what it is. So um, for me, that was the amazing part of it, is being in the Swartland, which is my home, and it's been my home for the last eight years, um, being with all these winemakers and, and people that had a big influence on what I do today and still being able to make Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in amongst these guys, which is, for me, amazing. Yes, we have the Swartland, the Shannon, the Grenache, Mouvert, those things, but I think that the specialness about it is planting something that's unique, different, um, something that you can really, you know, in 10 years' time sit and say, fuck it, you know? Um, this is not burgundy, but damn, it's good. You know? Talking about burgundy, Something like I, I just got a question here if you can plant Gamay. <laughs> from, so that is still a secret, Brandon. but um, that is still a secret. But I've got the, not the first, the second guy in South Africa that we're planting Gamay. Yeah. Um, we'll have a mother block. So we're working with the, with the, with the nurseries now to, to create the mother block. I'm planting 0.5 of a hectare, so which means it's about 3,000 vines the, um, next year. Yeah, of Gamay. Cool. Um, but I think uh, we've been talking quite a lot now, and we actually have very beautiful wines in front of us. And I think a few people might be thirsty because sometimes they don't want to drink before I tell them it's okay. Um, okay, please drink. <laughs> so I've been please thinking. drink. Uh, first of all. Just cheers, Joan. Thank you very much, and to uh, everyone that uh, you're here. Cheers. Um, <laughs> um, so we have actually. I've started with. I have a picture here of all the wines in front of us. Uh, we're gonna start with the Chardonnay de Palmit. And uh, do you want to tell me, or not me, uh, everyone else exactly? It's beautiful, and I'm so yeah. happy that I can sit here and drink your wines far far away from you even though i wish i was sitting together with <laughs> you guys 
Uh, but uh, this is better than nothing when you can't travel, you know? Yeah, it's, it's actually pretty cool. You know, it's nice sitting and, 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 you know, just reaching out to people. I mean, this was our travel time. We normally, you know, the, the winemakers, you know, maze for us travel time and try to get to, out to people and tasting the wines and doing all of that. And um, this year it's not there. Um, but, you know, that's just the best you'll get. So I think it's, it's, it's a really good way of doing it and a really good way of really interacting with people and, and you know, having something about the wine but maker at and I, I um, think uh, that's if, like for you, you you just had a daughter. So this is, you know, you can still talk about your wines a little bit and be home. So And that's amazing. I said, I think the lockdown probably couldn't come at a better time because it exactly. gave us a lot of time to really, you know, I think uh, she's now 11 weeks. We had, it, we had her a week before lockdown. So it's yeah. like literally like lockdown baby. Um, not made during the lockdown, but born during, born during lockdown. I think there's going to be a lot of babies in nine months from now, anywhere anywhere in the world. <laughs> but anyway, so it was a great time to be there. And, and, and you know, it, it, it's kind of, it's a blessing in disguise in that way, you know, that you, you can't travel, but you can be still there with the people in Norway or Sweden or Japan or wherever I go, you know. So yeah. that, that's a great thing to, to have that at least, so. Okay. But anyway, you are, anyway, if, palm meat. Everyone's got some of the palm meat in their glass. Um, this is the 2018 vintage. I'm not very technical when it comes to tasting wines and, and explaining wines. For, for me, it's more about, and if you look at the name of the wine, it says palm meat. So that's the name of the vineyard or the name where the vineyard grows, at least. That's a river kind of just passing through the vineyard or next to the vineyard. It's called the palm meat river. Um, for me, it's always from the get-go. It was important to uh, to to showcase vineyards and to showcase places rather than varieties or grape styles or anything like that. So, for me, the wine is the Palmit vineyard. If it's a Chardonnay or it's a Pinot Noir or it's a Grenache or it's a Sauvignon Blanc, it doesn't matter. It's the vineyard called Palmit, and that for me is important to showcase that the Palmit is is the vineyard. So um, this is Chardonnay, because that's, I think it's the first variety that I really fell in love with is Chardonnay. And um, unfortunately, in the, in the beginning, you know, to taste Chardonnays from South Africa and to taste Chardonnays in, in, in the New World style is, is quite a letdown. Um, I think a lot of people m mistake it from, you know, you're missing the point that you want to taste grape. And for me, it's always very, very important from day one is I want people to taste Chardonnay, the grape, and not a, not a made wine. You know, you want to taste what the grape tastes like from that certain area. Um, 2018 Vintage, which was in South Africa, probably the, the, the driest. Um, that was in the heart of the drought. So we really had a, the drought was really hitting us hard that time. But in an area like Elgin, where you get 1,200 mils of rain, the drought is actually a good thing. You know, going from 1,200 mils to maybe six, 700 mils in the year is actually more than enough for the grapes to really produce something amazing. So I think the concentration and the, the depth of the wine is there because of smaller crop, because of smaller bunches, because of higher acidity, lower, lower pHs. Um, the soil is, it's called Kauerbockefeld shale. Um, which is a type of shale soils. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's shale mixed with sandstone. So if, if that makes sense. So you got you got your 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 first layer, which is your Marmersbury scarly or your Marmersbury shale. That's the majority of the soil and probably the oldest, some of the oldest soils in the world mm -hmm. um, is Marmersbury shale. That's the bottom layer, and then. As you get up to the top, you, you get your other stuff like the granites and the sandstone and all of that. But in this region, there was a crack. So basically, the shale is pushing through. So, so the bottom layer is pushing through all the layers to get to the top. So Kohobokefeld shale, um, it's, it's clay-based. So it's got about 20 25% clay in the soil, so a lot of clay in the soil. Um, it's a very stony, rocky soil. Uh, so it's quite a poor soil, but it has very good uh, moisture, keeps moisture very well. Um, the vineyards was planted, uh, I think it's 1996. Um, fuck my, my maths, how old is that? That's about 20, 
four years old or something, <laughs> something like that. So it's it's the vineyards are not that old. Um, I think um, they some of the older vineyards in in the Elgin region. Um, so Elgin, sorry, just Elgin is on the the southeast coast of of South Africa. So when you when you take the Swartland, we're on the west coast, and you go south southeast, you head um, more towards the Pacific side, uh, yeah, um, the Indian side, and that is the um, the Indian Ocean, so yep. that is the eastern side of South Africa, basically. Anyway, so it's two different. We're about two hours apart from this vineyard, so where I am, there's about two hours drive southeast from here. Um, and within this two hours, there's a quite a diverse in in altitude and in weather and in rainfall and everything. So um, to give you an example, the normal Swartland um, on days like this will have. 40 degrees in the Swartland, you'll drive to Elgin and it's 28 degrees Celsius. So, you know, there's normally like a 10 to, to 12 degrees Celsius difference. Um, so much cooler, high rainfall, like three times the rainfall we get in the Swartland. Um, the vineyards are all trailers on the GEO system. So I think with Chardonnay and with Pinot Noir, they just like to be trailers. Um, they quite, you know, they don't really grow the well in the bush pine because they're not that strong growers like a Grenache, for example. So all trailers, um, everything farmed. We've been farming this organically since 2012. So it's been going on for quite a while. It's my first vineyard I work with. So this is uh, the first vintage I did was 2010 of this, actually. Um, it was the first vineyard I started with. And um, yeah, we've been putting a lot of effort. We're putting a lot of time. But through that all, Unfortunately, in three years' time, I'm going to stop working with this vineyard and only work with the Chardonnay on the farm. But again, coming to the farm, then it's, I, I was looking for places where I can find Kaubokkefeld shale, where I can find sandstone, where I can find these conditions that I have with this vineyard because I know it works pretty well with Chardonnay, but within the heart of the Swartland. So that was kind of the, the mindset behind it. But just quickly on the wine, it, you know, it comes in, we press it, nothing added from the get-go this particular wine was about 50 percent concrete fermentation yeah. and 50 percent old barrels um i did have a little bit of extra money so i've got about 10 percent new oak it's my first time i use new oak on my wine but i mean you know why not if you, if you got a couple of extra bucks in the bank um so 10 percent new oak um 50 percent oak 50 percent concrete it sits in there for about around about 12 to 14 months on the lease, um, not moving it. So we worked very um, oxidatively before ferment. So the juice kind of turns like brown, like um, um, like tea, basically. And then the fermentation starts and it goes into this reductive state. So oxidative before fermentation and very, very reductive after ferment still bottling. Um, so let's say 14 months on the lease, um, rack it off, um, straight into a tank, um, depending on the vintage, I'll add sulfur or not. 2018, no sulfur added. So the total sulfur is probably like eight. Um, sits in a tank for a week or two and then straight to bottle. So it's literally fermented grape juice, spends 14 months in a tank or in a barrel um, and it goes to bottle. So not adding things and not taking things away. And I want the purity of Chardonnay. Yes, Chardonnay is a grape that's more showy. It's um, automatically Chardonnay is, is something that's more, you know, it's got his nose in the air. It's got a little bit more of a perm in his hair. It's, it's just got that kind of spirit of something that's more classic. Um, so automatically the wine comes a front as more classical style, although it's completely natural without any additions. Um, so it's pretty cool. And that's what I love about this grape. You know, I do love the funky stuff. I do love the cloudy and the weird and the, the weird swat and stuff, but I do like the classical stuff as well. So for me, being able to make a wine with a 3.19 pH, that's why the wine is so classical and clean. Um, is amazing you know i want to do that and but i want to showcase people that this wine can stand next to any classical chardonnay and will be great you know it doesn't stand out to be a natural weird wine it's just a classical good balanced chardonnay so and yeah th that's what i really love with this wine because it's so classical and you know we we talked about your wines when i were at your place and you know some of them are like mistaken definitely for like burgundy or even 
we had one of yours that could have been wine from Jura, you know, that style. And, you know, there were, oh. when you taste them a little bit. So, and, and this is as natural as it can get. And that's, I think yeah. that's something that people need to understand about uh, the natural part as well. Um, because if, if we're going to, before we go into the red wines, I just want to show people because we're not having this in the tasting today, but you make uh, other brands as well. You make, um, so you have J.H. Meyer that we have your signature wines, which is like the more elegant style Pinot and, and Chardonnay. But then you have Madrock, uh, which is a totally different style. Like, can you just explain a little bit, like, why you have the three different, like the different labels and, and a little bit about this type of yeah. winemaking? Yeah, look, I, I think it's 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 like having children, you know, they all got their own personalities and they're all, you know, uh, persons change and it's different and, and they treat it the same way. I mean, if you've got three children, you brought them up the same way, they're going to be different because their personalities are different. And that's what I always say with the grapes, you know, Chardonnay is one of those grapes that's, this, it's the same winemaker, it's the same seller, it's the same everything is just a different grape so it will be more classical and that's the thing with the swartland stuff so in swartland we have higher temperatures so automatically we have higher ph's so automatically we have more instability so a little bit of cloudiness or a little bit of funkiness or anything like that but it's the same principle it's the same focus and the same mindset so mother rock is my swartland project um, that we work on focusing on Swartland and focusing on on alternative styles, you know, like skin contact and um, carbonics and, and different fermentations. And, and that's kind of the fun range, if you want to put it that way. It's something that we can experiment with. And I think the name Swartland backs us a lot in that. Weird to say it, but, you know, people expect something fun and weird from the Swartland, even though you can make beautiful classical wines, but there's that little bit of expectation these days within the wine industry that they think Swartland, yes, it's okay for a Swartland wine to be funky, but if I make a funky wine from Elgin, they're going to say, what the fuck? Yeah. You know, so for me, that's kind of my my artistical side, I guess, that's more into those wines, but it's the same style, it's the same mindset, it's the same focus, the, the vineyards change, um, the, the, the grapes composition change, but it's the same philosophy behind it so um, I think with the labels and with with the wine and everything it's just something that's more artistic if you see if you compare the Jade's Meyer to the, the the Mother Rock the Mother Rock is more artistic and the Jade's Meyer is more classical and you know there's this wine drinkers across the world I mean a lot of people love the Jade's Meyer and don't like the Mother Rock and vice versa you know you got that kind of and that's the amazing thing about wine, you know, that everybody has different tastes and, and, and styles and things like that. But um, for me, the, the Swartland was always the thing where I can a little bit let my hair loose. You know, you remember when it was still long. Yes. So when I just loosen it and that's that's Swartland. And, and when I look like this, um, I'm dressed in J.H. Meyer. So that's why. You know. <laughs> so I'm very happy that you cut your hair just for today. But, you know, I, I'm... Especially for this tasting. Especially for this tasting. <laughs> but... Uh, I just need to show you because we had something really um, fun going on uh, when I visited and that was actually your new tanks came in. Uh, that was uh, an, a big experience and I just want to show them a picture of you. You're not going to see it, but I have a beautiful photo of you when, uh, you know, um, you were standing in front of, let's see where I have the photo, um, here. Um, yeah, no, there. I have a photo of you standing in front of the container. Well, I have clothes on. <laughs> I can, I can Am I you. wearing clothes on the photo at least? <laughs> you're wearing clothes, yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. No, but I have, <laughs> I'm showing a photo of you when you're standing in front of the container just like this when we just got it up. Uh, and then, you know? <laughs> and then I'm going to see if I can find the other one. Uh, this live thing is so interesting. Yes, I'm going to show them a beautiful photo of the uh, tanks. Um, so we have these uh, cement tanks. I'm showing them a picture of the cement tanks. Can, can you just like, what were they called, these uh, shape, like this shape? They're from Italy. And um, yeah, yeah. So it's basically uh, the, 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 the conversation goes like this. So you got the eggs, so everybody knows the concrete eggs. 
And obviously the egg, the shape of the egg, there's something about it, you know, it, it's not only because of this look from the outside, there's actually something, there's some science behind the shape of the egg, in, at least. Um, but then people had this conversation of when an egg gets laid, it's not standing up straight, it's normally lying flat. So let's change that person that's thinking about the egg needs to be stand up straight. So what we did, or not what we did, what they did, it was they, they made the egg, but it's lying flat like an egg should be. So um, it's basically an egg inside. It's the same kind of oval shape. Um, the idea with the square on the outside is to stack them. So you can stack them into like corners. So where, with the round thing, you can't really stack it as nice. With the square sides, you can really stack it. So I think that's the the, the, the logic behind that. But the, the egg shape is pretty amazing because um, there's two, three things. Uh, the Firstly, the shape means the wine's rotating all the time. So you've got constant batonage, if you want to call it that. You've got constant um, suspension of your leaves with built palate, which creates a um, little bit more elegance in the wine, which kind of stabilizes the wine better. That's the first thing. Um, secondly, the, 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 um, the concrete itself is actually porous. So it gives the same effect that we'll get out of wooden barrel. Um, but not the taste of tannins or oak or anything like that. So you got that oxygen entering the wine very slowly, um, but there's no, you know, tannin or oat extract or anything like that. And then thirdly is the thickness. You saw how thick they are and how fucking heavy. I mean, one of those tanks is probably like three and a half tons, and you you saw the whole process getting yeah. in there. So because it's so thick, your your temperature are very regulated. So you've got very consistent temperature. And if you think about wine. If you want to age wine well, you need to do consistent temperature. If you want to sit at 15 degrees Celsius, you want to keep it there constant. So fluctuation isn't good. So that's the three main reasons for concrete and, and then the egg shape at the end of it. So those are basically the natural eggs. They're lying flat and not on their heads. So basically, I got a question here from uh, someone watching, uh, and he asked if the ferments temp if the ferment temperatures are controlled. And I guess you just answered that question with with the tanks uh, a little bit. Yeah, it's um, I believe in warmer ferments uh, because we work with natural fermentations and we work with no additions of anything. So for me, the quicker the ferments start. The quicker they CO2, which protects the wine, and the quicker the sugar is gone, which protects the wine as well because when there's sugar and oxygen you have bacteria so for me quick warm fermentations is ideal um, but again you see how we work we put it in a cold room so the grapes are pressed at like 10 12 degrees celsius so your ferment starts quite cool and then putting it into egg the, the the temperature are very consistent staying cooler temperature so you never reach very high temps but i don't ferment cool i ferment my whites will ferment at like 22, 23 degrees Celsius, um, which is warm for white wine in the, in the modern style of winemaking. Yeah. Should we uh, continue for, we actually have two red wines and we're t just talking and talking, you and me here. Uh. Um, <laughs> uh, we have two Pinot Noirs. Uh, we're starting with the Cape South Coast. Um, no. And this is 2017 and it's Pinot. Um, Cape South Coast, for people that doesn't know, the where are the vineyards located? So, uh, yeah, basically the South Coast started where where Elgin starts. So when you when you have you have this big mountain range that basically cuts off the Cape from the rest of the Western Cape. So. Um, when you in when you over those mountains, it's called the Solaris Pass. Um, you go into the South Coast region. So you're sitting on the south end, so the most southern point of Africa basically is where the South Coast starts, and then it runs all the way down to George, where I'm actually where I'm from. So to take an example, to go all the way from the one end of the Cape South Coast to the other end of the Cape South Coast is about five hours drive. So it's a big, it's also a big region, but within this region. You get Elgin, you get Hermanus, you get um, um, uh, Botrefir. There's a couple of appellations within this region. But because I work with um, three different vineyards, so I work with vineyards in the Yemen Arda, I work with vineyards in Elgin, and I work with vineyards in the Leersdorp, which is just behind Franzuk. Um, 
all of these regions do fall within the south coast area, but it's also regions on their own. So you can have Yemel and Arda, but the Yemel and Arda is part of the south coast because it's sitting there. So um, for me, I've got the single vineyard. So the Elans Rafir, for example, the next one we'll taste is a single vineyard from Valiersdorp. Um, but that forms part of the Cape South Coast and that forms part of the wine that we're drinking now. So my idea was always to to have the single vineyards the best possible. So when you work with the wines, you always get, let's for example, say I make 20 barrels of each and then we select barrels. So you'll see with the, the Elans River, for example, it's only 1,443 bottles that's been selected. So I choose the best barrels that for me is the best representation of the site. And then I use that for the single vineyard. And then whatever is left of that will go into the south coast. The same, I've got the Palmit, I've got the Craddock Peak, and I've got the Klein Refier. It's the other three Pinot Noirs that I have. The same with them. So the best barrels goes into the single vineyard, and then the rest goes into the south coast. So it's on this specific vintage, 2017, it's... Um, it's from the Palmit, so which is the um, Bockefeld Shale, um, sitting at about 450 meters altitude. Then it's the Elans Refir, which is the sandstone, um, sitting at about 720 meters altitude. And then it's the Klein Refir, which is the Yemlan Arda, which is more clay-based, clay shale-based soils at about 350 altitude. So they're all different altitudes. They're all different um, terroir at the end of the day, but the uh, all Pinot Noir, all the 115 Dijon, so Burgan, Burgundian clone, um, they all fermented 100% whole bunch. So like you've seen in my cellar, I don't own a destemmer because I think it's too much work to fucking clean that thing after a day. So um, I agree. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just chucking in the grapes and getting some dirty Swedish feet in there is for me more idyllic. Um, so everything whole bunch fermentation, everything spends about depending on the vintage, but anything from eight, sometimes nine weeks on the skins. Um, this particular year, 2017, was about eight weeks skin contact, um, stems and, 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 and everything. And then from there, it goes into old barrels. So on, this, on the Pinot Noir, I only use French oak. Um, second, third, fourth, fifth, um, 20th fill. I think the oldest barrel is the same age as nickel. So it was born in 1999. So it's 21 years old. So that's my oldest barrel. But there's still Pinot Noir going in there. So um, old barrels, neutral oak, it spends about, again, 12 to 14 months. I like to keep my wines a little bit longer. Um, I know a lot of the natural wine trend is to bottle your wines after nine or eight months. But for me, the wines actually needs more time to stabilize. So I take a little bit longer before I bottle it. Um, yeah, so I choose the best barrels. It goes into the Elans Refir single vineyard, the Craddock Peak, the Klein Refir, and the Palmit, and then everything that's left, big happy family, blend it together, and boom, pops your uncle. Um, the main thing about this one was no sulfur. I don't know if you guys can see on the, there's like a little um, stamp that says, no sulfur so the main thing about this was to be able to create a wine without adding any sulfur um, but the thing is what i try to do here is to have a wine that i can bottle and sell faster um, because you know sending wine overseas is always a thing when there's not sulfur added so um, with the the Elans Refir, the Palmit, the single vineyards, I do add like 10 to 15 parts, depending on the vintage. Um, but on this one, it was like, okay, let's add nothing and get to sell it within two years or a year, rather, where the El Elans Refir and those things, I, I tend to say, keep it for five, keep it for 10, whatever years, because it can handle it. Where this one is something that I want to move faster if you want to if you want to put it that way but it's it's still it's got all the elements of a good pinot noir you know it's got the grippiness it's got that tannic bite it's got the it's very earthy vibe to it um it's all the best you know it, it's it's a little bit of everything from from the single vineyard so it's still properly farmed it's still vineyards i mean the average age is about 18 years on these vineyards mm. Um, three different soil types, um, low yields. We get on these vineyards, we get about 32 hectoliters, which is quite low, I guess, in South African terms per hectare. And um, still, again, the same principle. It's just something that I thought, you know, le let's do something fun with it, you know, rather than, than too serious. 
I was going to ask uh, what you eat to this wine, but you only braai in your country, so... <laughs> so anything you can put on a barbecue, that will eat with this, you know? <laughs> anything you can put on fire. I always joke, and I said, you know, the best dish I've had with all of these wines is instant noodles. You know, if you... But if you want to go fancy, you can always braai a steak, but two-minute noodles, we call it in South Africa, is the best comparison with all of the wines. But yeah, anything you can grill on the fire, that works well with it. Maybe I should eat The some wines is, is, is also, sorry, the wines is, is, is made, the drinkability of a wine is very important to me. So I always look at drinkability when you make a wine. And if I can't drink a wine, I can't sell a wine. So I always look, can I drink it? Do I like it? Yes, and then I sell it. You know, fuck the rest. You know, at the end of the day, it's something that, that I need to be proud of and that I need to consult. And and when I'm at a table or when I'm at a, a party or at a braai or wherever, I want to drink wine that refreshes me. I want to drink wine that gives me energy. And so I need to be an upper and not a downer. And, and a lot of this old new world wines is too rich, too alcoholic, too overworked and it's literally you drink a glass and it's like fuck it you know i'm going to bed and i'll cook with the rest tomorrow um but i want the wine that's refreshing and and you'll see on all the wines acidity is quite high i mean the acidity is there and that for me is super important so acid is number one in wine in my opinion and you want something that's fresh and vibrant and and so it's not the classical red wine, eat it with red meat kind of thing, you know. This is amazing with fish. This is amazing with, with oysters. This is amazing with noodles. You know, it's, it's something that's that's quite diverse. And it's it's for me, that is wine. Wine needs to be joined and drank, you know. If, if I buy a bottle, I want to drink it. Um, and I think that's... that's um, I think I, I, I'm looking back to, like, dinners we had at your place or, like, um, an, an evening your friends, other winemakers came over and... The only thing we were drinking were your wines from the beginning, like yours and everyone that brought a bottle of their own wine. And I think that's so important. Like if you make wine, you need to be proud and put it in front of your friends on a dinner. Like that's all. Exactly. And, 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 and that is why we make wine. We make wine to drink it and to be proud about what we're drinking. And if I can't drink it, why make it? You know, so for me, making these wines... That's what I drink, and that's what I like to drink. And and luckily, there's a lot of amazing people in this world that enjoy the wines with me. But there's some people that don't drink this style. There's some people that 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 prefers, and that's all for their own. But I mean, I first look at what I drink, and if I can't drink a bottle of wine within half an hour, I don't bottle it. You know, if I can't have a wine that I say I can finish this wine within half an hour, I won't bottle it. So no, that's the style. Let's uh, let's talk about Erlands Rivier for uh, for a bit. Um, what's it? Yeah, let, so first of all, what's the difference between these two? Uh, except for well, basically, it's uh, the other one's mixture, but is they're made basically the same way? They make basically the same way. Um, obviously, the one we just had it's got two other appellations in it. So, the one we just had had three different soil types: so sandstone, um, uh, clay, and shale. That's the three soils, three different altitudes, where this one is one single vineyard. So a single vineyard sitting about 720 meters. It's mostly sandstone soil, so the same soil types that I've got where I am now, basically. Um, it's a very, very unique vineyard. It's, it's, it's basically behind Franz Hook up in the mountains. Um, it's, it's one of the most beautiful sites you'll see in your life i think it's really really amazing because you're in the middle of the forest and it's trees and everything around you um it's very small yield so we get about 22 hectoliters per hectare from this um again your your skin ratio towards berries are quite high not skin your stem so it's very very concentrated small berries and very large stem so you'll find that the wine is a little bit more grippy there's a little bit more tannic taste to it yeah. um yeah. but the savoriness of the wine is amazing i think the wine is kind of you know that that when you have a sip and you kind of salivate and it's like mm -hmm. i need to have another sip or i need to eat something with it you know that yeah. kind of sherbetty vibe to it um and that's the idea behind it but it's the same style it's the same whole bunch of fermentations uh you know pgrs by feet once a day um and press with the basket press goes into old barrels for about 12 to 14 months i know months. how the press works um, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's still working with the screwdriver, really? actually. But... <laughs> I'm going to um, show them so the it's same, later on. <laughs> it's the same, same style. South Africa. Um, it's just for me, I think every wine and every barrel has got its own kind of um, microclimate within the barrel even, you know. Every barrel has got a different aspect that it brings to a wine because there's bacteria, there's things that evolves it. It's, it's, and when I taste wines and I taste through it and I find barrels that for me is standing out and showcasing the sky a bit better than others, I use it. So I tr try to choose... Out of, let's say, 10 barrels, I try to choose four of the barrels that showcase and represent the site the best for me, and that I'll bottle as the single vineyard. So, Yelan Srafir is, is, is the, the farm, is the name of the farm. Again, in South Africa, they're always, always a fountain, always a river. You know, that's the two things they always go to, because water is, in yep. the old days, the way you mark a place. So, if there's a river, it's called something river. Or if there's a fountain, it's called something fountain. So, that's yep. kind of the way they were marking farms and, and, and places in South Africa those days. Anyway, so it's a, it's a river again. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's really something, it's called Elan's Kloof is the appellation, but it's something special. It's something different. There's, there's one or two, three winemakers making wines from there. Um, it's quite special. And again, I mean, that was when I was working with this vineyard. For me, this was the the one that I was looking for in buying land. And where I'm at now is the closest resemblance of what we're going to have in, in, um, Yelan Srafir is the closest that we'll have what we have in Paket Pad. So, um, hopefully one day something like this we can produce. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so basically like, to explain to people right now what you're doing during harvest, it, uh, you're driving hours and hours every day during harvest to get grapes picked at different places, different spots and different vineyards and areas. But in a few years time, you will take all your like, um, you will have your vineyards planted at your own place which is amazing and it's such a nice place and it will be amazing. Yeah, look, I think I think in South Africa, you know, we, we've got the we've got the opportunity as younger guys. You know, look, I didn't grow up with wine. I didn't grow up in a family of wine. You know, I came here and made my own kind of ways. And but we've got this opportunity in South Africa to be anywhere in South Africa and buy grapes from anywhere you can find good enough grapes to work with. So we can work with a very diverse range of grapes with terroirs with areas, and I think that's amazing. To be able to, you know, to, to do that, um, but it's also great to have your own vineyards. You know, it, it's something about it. You know, it's something about, it, and we've talked about it so many times this harvest about planting a vineyard, preparing a soil. You know, leaving a legacy for the next generation, and 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 I truly believe that's coming back to our other story about old wines. Yeah. I truly believe in old wines, and I, I I believe there's very good ones, but there's very shitty ones as well. And then they're just riding the train about this vineyard is old, but this vineyard was probably not planted in the right way. It wasn't planted for the right reasons. Wasn't planted on the right clone, rootstock, soil, whatever. And for me, it's super important to plant with reason yeah so everything i did for the last four years was trying to figure out what to plant how to plant it and yeah. on what place to plant it and and that for me is important if you got that right and you got a soil that was virgin land and never seen a chemical in its life then you're going to make great wines from a vineyard that's five years old you don't need vineyards to be 100 years old yes it's going to be amazing in 100 years Fuck, I hope I'm not here in 100 years, but, you know, um, maybe for my child it would be great. But, you know, it, it's something that you want to create, but you want to see it grow as well. You know, and that's that's the thing that I have with the region as well. I want to make Paquette Per Grand Cru Swartland, and, and I think it's possible to do that. Um, but you need the right soil, you need the right mindset, and um, you need to be passionate about farming, you know. At the end of the day, Wine making, you guys made the wine. I didn't even make the wine this year. You know, I was here, you know, so little time. So it's about farming and it's about understanding when to pick and, and things like that. So, yeah, I think there's great 
to have your own vineyards is amazing. And you can farm it the way you want it. There's sustainability around that. I mean, because I think in the long run, it's not going to be as sustainable to keep up this just buying here, buying there, because more people are buying, more companies, bigger, more wealthier companies are buying in. Um, people are pulling vignettes out. You know, it's it's it's, it's a, not the best thing to sustain always, you know. So when you have your own stuff, yes, you have more gray hairs like you can see here, but, you know, <laughs> fuck, it's part of the game. I have a question here. Um, Gunnar, he's uh, mentioning that his wine is a little bit cloudy, his red. Uh, so maybe we should mention that it's actually not really filtered and this is how you make most of your wines. So... For people that don't understand the type, um, just yeah, yeah, this is how it is, and you don't have to look at it. Really. Yeah, the, the the depends. I mean, if you look at the Chardonnay, that's unfiltered and it's super clean. I don't know yeah. how you guys are, but my bottle are very clean. Mine is super clean. Uh, and my uh, Pinot uh, Cape South is super clean, but the Elans Rivier is a little bit cloudy, and I'm I'm used to this, so I I don't you know this is how I like it. Yeah, look, that, what it is, it's basically, it's 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 depending on the vintage again. So in the 2017, for example, our pHs might have been higher than we normally get in different years. So it, it gets a bit, a bit more technical, but if you think about pH, you think about stability. So the higher the pH, the more unstable, which means unstable proteins, which means cloudiness in wine. But it also forms with time. So when I bottle the wine, for example, it would be sparkling clean. But then as it ages and as it matures, the proteins start binding and it start dropping out. So if you um, if you work out quite hard, that proteins is, is good for you at the end of the day. But it's uh, it, it's just clean proteins basically sitting in the wine um, because we don't filter the wine, because we only rack the wine. Um, I think the wines intend to be more unstable in look than it's your normal filtered and fine wine, basically. But you get years, you know, you, you'll take, I don't know, the 2016, for example, and it's sparkling clean. You know, that, and, and that for me is the fun thing about wine, because then you're talking about vintage. Yeah. If you open a bottle of wine, you can actually say, just look at the cloudiness or look at the color of the wine automatically you see vintage warm dry hard vintage higher ph more cloudy yeah you know things like that so it's really wine yes you want kind of consistent i always say wine needs to be consistent in quality um because people ask me how do you keep consistency making wines in this natural way and i always say the best way to do it is saying i want consistent quality and representation of the vintage so if you take a wine that should represent the vintage. Yes, it's probably not as clean or not as spot on or perfect as a 2015 vintage, but it is the vintage, and that's what you're tasting. And and I had this guy, I don't know if he's listening in, but um, Joseph is from Austria and Kamtal area, and he came to me in 2016 vintage, which was probably the worst vintage in the history in the last decade in South Africa. And the vintage before the 15 was probably the best vintage we had in a decade in South Africa. And he came here and he was so let down and he said, fuck, and he came in, in 16, he should have come in 15, it was a great vintage and wada, wada, wada. And I told him, but that, that's not how you look at it. I mean, I think 16 is a much better year to come here because then you see the struggles, then you yeah. see how to, how, to, how to farm correctly, then you see how to, you know, get around things like drought and the sun and heat and things like that. It's, it's much more technical working in a, a dry, warm, difficult vintage than working in a super easy, good vintage. So, um, yes, when you drink the 16 now, you can feel it. I mean, you can feel that it was, I mean, we picked some grapes and it's like 48 degrees Celsius. I think the warmest we had, we were picking Sensa one day, and it's like the second week of February. And at 10 a.m. in the morning was 52 degrees Celsius in 2016. Jesus. So, you know, those kind of things, when you open a bottle of Senso 2016 now, you think about that and you remember that and you taste it and you can see it in the wines. And and for me, that is the perfect vintage, you know, is representing the vintage rather than, than trying to, to fake something that's not really it. So, yeah, I mean, wines can differ, maybe a little bit cloudier than others, but it's 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 it's... To everyone out there, it's all natural. It's um, it's just part of the wine. Um, 
I always say, you know, if you read the back of the bottle, it says that um, actually uh, that you have to keep the wine up straight for 24 hours if you don't want any sediment. But I'm not sure which back label you have. Or you have the American back label. I don't know if it says it, but normally I say it on the back. Yeah. yeah. No, I was going to say, yeah. Uh, that's, the, that's the American back. Yeah. <laughs> That's another thing we have to sort. That's Nichols fault. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's Nichols fault because this was maybe before his time. I don't know. <laughs> oh, maybe. Uh, but uh, so it's 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 just something I always say. You know, it depends how you like your wine. I yeah. mean, if you keep that wine up straight for 24 hours and you decant it, you won't have any cloudiness. I like the cloudiness. I Me think too. it gives a little bit of the spirit of the wine. Um, but it's all natural and it, it's, 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 it's kind of part of it. And, um, but I do understand that people think sometimes, shit, this What's is it? wrong or it's faulty or it's, and don't get me wrong. I think there's a lot of time when wine is cloudy, it's faulty at the same yeah. time. And then that's the big line you have to pull where a wine is faulty or a wine is yeah. natural. You know, that's a, there's a big difference. And that's another topic we can probably talk for another four hours about, but probably. I mean, yeah, that is, yeah. But I, I just put mine from the top, so it's quite clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could. Um, I think Ludwig had uh, had taken something from my bottle that I got, so uh, it was shaking yeah. around a bit. But it, I think yeah. it's it's I, really wonderful. Uh, what I think what happens? I think I sent some of the Japanese stock to you guys. Huh? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, talking about the Japanese. <laughs> While we talk about the Japanese, maybe you can explain to people, or that, because you made uh, wine special for or you make a lot of wine just for uh, for uh, japan i have this one waiting ah. for me so this is nice. this is the love child it's on a shelf i have a shelf in my wine fridge full of just south african mostly actually your wines um <laughs> so yeah this is a love story i will drink one day when should i drink this yeah. sorry when should i drink this one um look it's a pet nut so it's a natural sparkling wine um the 100 years i mean <laughs> depends when you when you feel like it but i always say you know, it's all of my wines is wines that you want to buy it open it drink it you know yeah. buy six of it you know drink five keep one yeah um it, it's it's made in a style where you have to consume and, and like you know like it's probably cliche, but life is too short to fucking wait on wine. So, yeah, I don't have the time and um, I think I drink whatever I can. And yes, I do keep some wines back, but I think the wines is wines that's, that's it's present and it, it, it's kind of almost seasonal in a way. You know, you want to feel the season still. You want, still want to drink wine that's recently there. And yes, there's something romantic and um, everything about the age wine and please do age some of them but um i think the wines are wines that's is really when when it reaches your your shops and show uh it's ready to drink i mean i wouldn't sell a wine that you can't drink yeah um yeah um, um, we've been going through old stock now so inside yeah okay <laughs> Here we no, inside, I, we're not allowed to sell any booze i was gonna just take that as like a last topic um i'm gonna let people um, just if you have questions for Joan, um, just please, we, at, as every time I go, you know, I talk too much and this um, streams are a little bit too long, but hey, it's fun and I'm very, very happy to have a friend <laughs> this time with me. Uh, but if you have any questions for Joan, please go ahead. And before we take the questions, I give you time to write a little bit. Uh, but I want to ask you, Joan. Uh, you just had a proper lockdown. If you compare it to Sweden, you know, we have been, uh, shops are open, restaurants are open. We, we ha I think we've been, you know, very, very lucky in a way here in Sweden with this COVID because we're still free to do basically almost whatever. Okay, we work from home, but comparing to how you had it, um, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about lockdown and how you think this will actually how it's been for the wine business because it's pretty bad. Uh, look, it, it, it's been hard. I mean, we, we've 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 all um, about a week before the lockdown started, they were announcing that we're going to go into lockdown, and about a day before the lockdown actually started, they announced that there will be no alcohol sales during this whole process, 
And about an hour into the lockdown, they announced that there's not going to be export as well. Yeah. So we were not allowed to export our wines. We were not allowed to sell our wines in locally. Um, we They actually took it so far and said we're not allowed to finish harvest. So people weren't allowed to pick their last grapes that were still on the vines. Um, although all the other fruit farmers could carry on with their farming, the wine apparently is not essential. So essentially they locked us down completely. There was a lot of ups and downs and eventually they opened up the picking. So they said, okay, you can finish your harvest and the production of wine, um, but you're not allowed to bottle wines, you're not allowed to label wines, you're not allowed to move any wines through your cellar. Um, so they basically fucking put a, th a rope around our necks and said, fuck you guys, for the next three weeks at that time, you're not going to do any business. Um, there's about, during this time, it was going to be three weeks. It ended up to be 11 weeks of lockdown, so 11 weeks without any sales. Um, throughout the process, they opened up the, the sales of, they said, yeah, you can export now for about a day. Um, as they opened it up, the first export went out and the truck got hijacked and they stole about 2.5 million worth of wine because they're not allowed to buy wine, so they just robbed the truck. <laughs> they just stole the whole truck full of wine that was supposed to be export. So then say, close it again the next day, it's too big of a risk, so not not exporting any wines. So we've been in lockdown for 10, 11 weeks without selling wine, without doing anything wine-related, um, which is bad. I mean, I, I, for me, it's all right because I export a lot and I've exported a lot before, but there's a lot of wineries. I think they're talking about 80,000 jobs that's being lost because of the lockdown. They're talking about 80 wineries, 80 wineries closing down before because of the lockdown. Um, yeah, it was just ridiculous. Um, we're also not allowed to smoke. So they closed all tobacco sales as well. And it's still closed. So on Monday, about three, three day, two days ago, they reopened the wine sales. That's after 11 weeks of no wine sales. Um, but you're not allowed to sell cigarettes. They say they're going to open cigarette sales on level one. So that's going to be December. So you're going to have eight months without cigarette sales. Uh, you know, I luckily I quit it at just before the lockdown. Well, well you only but, smoke uh, during harvest, so. <laughs> yeah, so it was good timing, but it's fucking ridiculous. Um, they, they, at the moment that, and, and, and the sad thing about this whole process is, that the illegal sales and the underground and the the, the 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 black market is thriving because you're not allowed to sell it. So now I give you an example. Um, a shitty packet of cigarettes cost about not even maybe one euro. You know, that's a shitty packet of cigarettes. That same packet of cigarettes now, 15 euros. One loose cigarette in the black market is one euro for one loose cigarette. For example, so you know things like that. It's 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 ridiculous. Uh, it's still carrying on. Uh, luckily, we're allowed to sell wine again. Um, I made some um, alternative plans that I can't probably talk about on national <laughs> on on well, international probably, media. Probably um, in Sweden. But, uh, it's been it's been hard, and I think for the industry in South Africa, it's going to have a knock-on effect um, in the years coming. There's a lot of wineries going to be closing. I mean, I'm I'm 90% export. There's a lot of people that's 90% 90% local sales. Yeah. And if you don't have that, what do you do? You employ people. Your vineyards need to be cared of. You 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 can't. You know, there's like I said, it's 80,000 jobs being lost just because of that. So it's been super hard for us in the lockdown. Beer. That's the one thing I was looking forward to to buy as soon as the lockdown open is a beer. But um, yeah, it's one of those things. You know, we we kind of we 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 coping with it. Um, I'm like I said, I've I've been making alternative plans, but um, I think there's a lot of wineries that's going to be um, in in deep trouble in the few months coming, which is a sad thing, you know, for the industry, um, just because of I mean something that's that doesn't make sense and. It's a power trip, I think, uh, but that's politics, and I don't want to talk about that. So no, let's no. That that's going to be a totally other 
an, another live stream about uh, private exit. conversation because then I can express myself. <laughs> yeah, we, we've, had <laughs> <laughs> we've had those. We've had those talks about yeah. politics in South Africa. That's a whole other story. Um, At least we've all got good wines, good weather, and um, we're having a braai going on the outside. So that makes me happy. I'm going to let you go and have your braai very soon. Uh, first, just a few questions. Uh, well, this is very yes. easy for me because, uh, or actually, I had a question. When will the wines from Johan's Vineyard come to Sweden? Well, I guess he's meaning the vineyards that you have planted at your place. Uh, but we have two importers working with your wines. We have Wine Rebels that we do this tasting together with today that has J.H. Meyer. And then we have Wine Trade that has Mother Rock uh, and Force Mature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, so, uh, <laughs> when will the wines from your vineyard to come to Sweden? The question is, uh, fuck, I, I hope sooner than later. Um, we're looking at normally, I mean, looking at your third third year of growth before you pick something, but then you have a little, little crop. Um, uh, I always try to, to, to kind of, you know, give a little bit of love to everyone. So send some everywhere. Um, but to be quite frankly honest, I, I guess with, with quantity, so we're going to be harvesting from the vineyard, um, 2025, so five years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before we really get a proper crop to really, you know, in the beginning of the three years, you'll get a crop, but it's so little. Um, so what we do just to explain to the people quickly is you plant the vineyard. And then for the first three years, you basically cut off all the grapes that's there. So you want your vineyard to push his energy and his, um, his yeah, basically his energy into his growth. So, so the vineyard is growing to be a strong vineyard rather than pushing energy into a grape bunch to ripen it. So um, you pick the branches when they're still green, you cut them off. It's a fucking sad, sad day when you do that. Um, you, you cut them off and leave them and then you let the vine grow rather than ripening grapes. So you do that for three seasons and then you start the fourth season, you start picking grapes. You can do it in the second year, but we, we try to get the grapes to, or to get the vineyards to be you know, set well in its place before we harvest any grapes. So then you harvest the grapes in year four, and then it takes about a year to get it into bottle, and then another maybe a year to get there. So um, let's put a date on, uh, what is it now? The, it's the 3rd of June, 2025. <laughs> we'll have this down. tasting again, and we'll um, Sauvignon Blanc from the mountain. <laughs> I have another question, and that is just like a guy that likes uh, his Pinot Noir very elegant, uh, and yeah. he asks if yours are a bit smoky and rough, or if they're elegant, and I would, well, you can talk about if they're what you think, uh, but he's asking how uh, do you get a Pinot Noir to become elegant in style? Look again. It's 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 uh, your 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 first thing and the most prominent thing is the vineyards. You know, is the terroir. You know, I, I the way we make wine because it's supernatural is um, ninety percent is vineyard, and then the wine making technique and style comes in. Um, I do like to work with the stems, um, which gives the wines a little bit of a rougher edge in the beginning. Um, we've been drinking lately of the library stock 2014 for example which is six years old which is if i could and I, if i had the fucking cash flow and money i would have released the 2014 now and keep it you know keep the wines five six years before i release it because yes the 2017 it is rougher around the edges there's that smokiness um from the stems um there is that tiny kind of acidic bite to it but you know give this wine another three years and it's going to be amazing so you know, it's always difficult to say I'm making an elegant Pinot Noir, but when will it be elegant, you know? Yeah. So um, if you look at style, the wines are wines that, that that probably needs a bit more time to be elegant and soft. In the beginning, it's more acidic and sherbety. And like I said, that kind of thirst quencher, you know, when you're thirsty, you drink a glass and kind of you go for another and that kind of thing. So... Um, I think by destemming the grapes, it will probably be a little bit more elegant as well. Mm -hmm. But for me, then you're throwing away 
20% of your terroir because there's a lot of the terroir that sits in the stems. You know, it's not only the berries, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, so we, we try to find a balance. But yes, I do agree that this, if you look at the Elan Srafir, for example, 17, it's a little bit more. Um, the acidity is there. Um, the tannins are there. We had the 14 that I drank a week ago and it's spot on. So it's difficult to please everyone, I guess, and it's difficult to get the wine at the perfect time. When is the perfect time to drink or sell it? Because a lot of people prefer this. A lot of people are asking for fresher, more acidic-driven wines. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's always a, I don't want to say a gamble, but it's always a thing where you said, you know, do you like your steak medium, medium rare or well done? You know, it's the same fucking story. Uh, you can't please everyone. So you're trying to do something in between. Um, like, But like I said, I, I think the wines can age a bit. Um, that's, yeah. But elegance come with time and elegance come with farming. Um, and I think destemming, to be honest, plays a big role as well. And we don't destem. So we need to find elegance in maceration and in aging. So, yeah. Okay, um, uh, you need to eat soon, but I have one last question for you before we say goodbye for this time. Uh, how's, Nic gonna... how's Nicole's wine going? I know, you want to ask him? <laughs> yeah. Nico, Nico, oh, how's your hello. pet going? Hello. How, um, how's your well, pet you mean, you mean my wine, you yeah. mean actually our wine, because yeah. you did the breast. Um, for me, well, I was standing on the side with the remote, um, with the pump. So now it's 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 not what it needs to be, but um, I think it has potential. We just had to pick it a week or so earlier. Um, but I guess it was a good first attempt on my birthday. So, yeah, thank you for your help. <laughs> Only time will tell. Time will tell. Yeah, time will tell. I, I <laughs> Maybe we should age it for a couple of years. Maybe it will get better <laughs> with <Again>. age. <laughs> Everything becomes yeah. better with age, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, th I think something like that is a good example. I mean, you, you, and that's why I always say, I think it's, it's to understand and to find your specific style takes time. You know, it's not about... A lot of, and, and that's the, the, the downside about South Africa because it's so open to buy any grapes from anywhere. Everybody's making wine these days and trying to make, but if you don't understand your style, you don't understand what you want, you're never going to be satisfied. So, I mean, for Nicole to make a barrel now is great, but it's also a learning curve. And, and then the first one will never be the perfect one. Um, but it's a good stepping stone in saying this is the style and this is the approach and the more you deal with a certain thing, the more you'll get to that style. And and that's how I formed my style. I mean, if you look at my old 2010, 2011 wines, it was classical, you know, it was um, big, full, riper um, style, which um, at that stage, it was something that sold and I, I liked it. But now I kind of found a balance where... You can have both ends of the party, you know. So, but yeah, it's it's. I guess it's a little bit more, and maybe a little bit more Jura-ish, you know, kind of the kind of lighter acidic. Uh, that's what I love in wines. Yeah. yeah so this was uh, this was amazing to have you uh, with us. Um, people that everyone that's been watching, please comment uh, what you think about the wines. Uh, what do you feel like? We haven't really been talking about flavors and aromas. But I, neither of us really does that really. Uh, I think I prefer talking about the winemaking and the style and like the region, and that's why I have you here. You know, if people have the glass in front of them, then can they can you know feel it a little bit by themselves. But. Yeah. Look, I, 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 think, I think there's a time and a place, but, you know, talking about, you can't, you know, a lot of times you, you're playing, so when I taste the wine and I say I taste raspberries, you automatically going to taste raspberries because I said so. Exactly. Uh, I think a lot of time wine is about your personal experience in life. You know, I can be, we always joke about it, but, you know, when, when I taste the wine, I smell my Oma's fucking rusks in there, you know, because when, <laughs> when I was little, we were sitting in the kitchen and my Oma was baking some rusk in the, uh, in the oven and I had a certain smell of anise. Um, which were there, 
and I can taste it in a lot of the Pinot Noirs, but I can't explain that to anyone. I can't say my wine tastes like my Oma's Rask, uh, my grandma. Um, so you can't, it's difficult to really tell people, look, this is what wine should taste like. You know, there's, there's so many comments and so many things you can guide people for sure. I think that is a good thing, but there's, there's certain smells and tastes because, you know, wine is probably one of the things that you use all your senses in. There's not a lot of things in life that you use everything from sight, listen, smell, taste, feel, everything is, you get everything in wine and Mm. that you can't force because people has different ways of growing up, people has different living conditions, people, and all of that plays a big role in in what you're tasting tonight. Mm. Even the glass, you know, you know, I, I am about glasses, but even the glass is a big difference in taste and smell. So, for me, really trying to talk about taste and smell is is beyond the purpose because you're not really – what I smell in my glass, which is obviously a Zalta, um, it's it's different well, than you. I drink from Riedel because I'm sponsored by <laughs> Riedel in this tasting. So. <laughs> he didn't say oh, Zalta. Sorry. Zalto. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's stupid little things like that that, that makes a difference on your on your – on your wine and it's 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 all for the same you know a lot of people say fuck they love drinking wine and a little cool drink like a little glass like that and it's they have a different experience so for me really it should more be about where it's from and where it grew up in a way than then what's it's you know what are the characteristics at the end of the day because the characteristics of the wine is what it is is your interpretation of it nah. And that's, that's why I have you here talking about them. I could sit here and talk and tell people, yeah, this, you know, this is uh, lemons or whatever. But th- that's why yeah. I have you here to tell them the story about it. But um, I ask you to just hang on for uh, a minute and I'm going to say thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Joanne, for doing this. I'm sure people are very, thank very you. happy to uh, be able to actually hear the winemaker. Uh, yeah, thank you for listening to me. Fuck, it's it's... It's quite an effort, I think, to listen to me for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, poor Nicole and Jane and them, they have to listen to me fucking talking. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, cool. Thanks for listening anyway, and thanks for joining. Thank and you. And I hope for... you enjoy the wines. And um, yeah, we hope to see you soon in Sweden. See you soon. And I hope you can come here. And I just ask you to hang on for a second while I say. Tack så jättemycket till allihopa för att ni tittade idag.